Hi there. I'm Scott, and this is Great Scott Knitting, a podcast, episode 10. Wear your mask and go vote, folks. Today it is October 26th, 2020, and I'm coming to you from Wichita, Kansas, where it was a chilly 28 degrees today. That's as high as it got. Um, it was cold and snowing today, so it's a good day to wear you know, knitted objects. Um, if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you. Um, thanks for checking it out. I hope you like what I'm doing here. Uh, for those of you who are returning viewers, uh, thank you for coming back and uh, seeing what's going on today. So, I do have a finished object that I have been able to complete over the past couple of weeks. And this is it right here. It may look familiar to those of you who caught last week because I knit another one very similar to it last week. Um, this one, I dyed the yarn myself. So this shawl is, this is the scrunchable, or no, what am I talking about? This is the Ribs and Arrows shawl by Benjamin Matthew Designs. And oh, it's just such a delight to, to knit. And of course, there's Spock modeling it for me. Um, just a lot of fun for for knitting. Um, so yeah, so grand features of this shawl. It's just got a really basic um, pattern of ribbing, which is just sort of a um, a garter stitch rib with with a you know a, a line that goes through it really a lot of fun the the joy of this however is just the color work so it's four basic colors um most people are choosing um you know some basic solids or tonal colors i went i dyed up some of this this tonal colorway in um, royal blue, teal, kelly green, and brown. And it just is, it's a delight to knit. What, the fun part of it is that it ends with this great mosaic pattern in this sort of arrow design. Just a lot of joy. Um, and then the other really cool thing about this is that it has an Icelandic bind off. I had not done an Icelandic bind off before. And let me tell you, if you are doing a garter stitch shawl or really anything that has a garter stitch at the end of it, um, this Icelandic bind off just disappears. It just looks like another garter stitch row and ends. It's just so perfect. And it's really super stretchy. So, yeah. Love that bind off. Didn't know it before. Thank you, Benjamin Matthews, for introducing me to that little gem. I put it back on. But um, this is really woolly wool. Uh, this I, I made this with Patton's Classic Wool Worsted, which is a 100% wool yarn non super wash um so it's definitely one of those hand hand wash items that i'll have to be careful with uh yes wearing my royal shirt um out of you know i'm not a huge sports fan but one some of the few teams that i do follow are the kansas city royals um so yeah i do have some yarn dyeing uh, items that I do want to share with you. I had a couple of skeins of Dyer Supplier Bouncy Aaron um, that I wanted to dye up. Um, the Bouncy Aaron weight, or the Bouncy Aaron yarn from Dyer Supplier is a 100 gram skein that's only 170 yards, but um, it, it's really absolutely a delight to work with. It's a 100% superwash merino wool yarn. 
And here are the colorways that I dyed up. Um, so it looks like a really short skein, but it has, when they say bouncy, they mean it. It has some stretch to it. Um, this I did with, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember how I dyed this, this thing. Oh yeah. Um, I did basically some space, uh, kind of a space dye to it. Um, with just some uh, food coloring in a um, condiment bottle or just a, like a, a bottle that had a little squeeze tip to it and um, laid it out in a shallow pan and then just squeezed the dye onto it in a uh, just a pattern that created basically pink, blue, and yellow, and then they washed into each other to create some oranges and greens and teals but yeah that one's just absolutely so much fun lots of of color to it uh just very bright and and i, I don't know i that one just really excites me um the second skein i did was i did a base of of a forest uh, well kind of a light foresty type green and then the leftovers from this skein, I had some leftover dye from this skein. Um, then I just sort of did a wash of those additional colors over the top to kind of glaze it. And not knowing how this was going to turn out or if it would turn out, um, it's really cool. It has some lovely um, blues and purples coming in, um, some pink um, that came from the pink as well. So I, I, I don't know, I became, uh, this one sort of became one of my favorites immediately. So uh, this was a lot of fun uh, playing with these dyes and uh, with this particular skein, um, uh, base of yarn. I would, I would say that I would definitely get more of this. Um, it is a, it is when they say bouncy, like I said, it has a real good bounce to it. It's just a lovely texture to that yarn. Just a beautiful twist to it. I would say I'd call it a high twisted yarn, but wow, it is so nice. Um, so that's uh, my latest dyeing experiment. I will put up a video on how I dyed these yarns. Um, probably next week um one other little project i have going on that i just started um so it may take me a while to finish what i'm planning on getting done is i'm dying up let's see dying up some mini skeins so this is a a 20 gram um skein of dyer supplier 7525 superwash merino nylon um you know so basic uh, just a basic soft blend that i um partitioned off a, a 100 gram skein into into this mini skein and what i am doing is creating some little tutorials i would guess i would call them some basic tutorials on how to dye yarn in your own kitchen using Kool-Aid, using several different techniques. Um, the technique I used on this was to hand paint this skein of yarn. Um, so I just laid it out and used a foam brush. I used a um, condiment bottle with a little bit of Kool-Aid mixed up into it um, just to hand paint it, just to play around. Um, the reason I am doing this is I am still on a job hunt and as a trainer, sometimes I get asked for examples of my instructional design. And the thing is, most of my, the things that I have designed for, you know, for teaching 
belongs to the company I was working for when I created it. So number one, I don't have access to it. And number two, the information in that training would be proprietary. So I wouldn't be able to share it with a new or prospective um, company that I wanted to work with. So I'm creating some little mini tutorials, little mini trainings on dyeing yarn. Yes, it's not business related, but the techniques of instructional design and some of the things that I would do for that are very similar to what I would design for a um, actual corporation. When I am done putting it, putting together a number of these little mini tutorials, I'm going to share those with you guys and put them out uh, up here on my channel uh, so you guys can play around with those and make use of them if you so desire. Um, with a video on um, how to dye this yarn uh, will also be little some little cheat sheets that you can download and I'll make those available too. Um, so especially if you wanted to do this with some kids, you have a free afternoon, um, you know, or, you know, COVID makes it where they have to stay at home all the time and you want some additional activities, this might be a nice little thing to play around with. Um... Okay, works in progress. My works in progress are, well, I'll start with this one. This one's sort of an ongoing work in progress. You've seen this multiple times. It's my scrunchable scarf with my um, yarn or my uh, dye mixing um, experiments. This is going to be just a little rainbow scarf. It's an 80-20 reclaimed yarn from a sweater. And so that one's still going on. I haven't made a lot of progress with it. Um, however, I have... Oh, and that pattern that I'm using on this scarf is the um, Scrunchable Scarf by Susan McCone. And really, really super simple that makes a great looking uh, scarf. So certainly worth trying, uh, looking into and trying out. If you needed a quick knit type of scarf that is easy to memorize and you just knit until you're, you can't stand it anymore. Um, second thing I'm working on is, of course, my second set pair of socks. I have finally made some real headway here. So I have... The body, the toe, is, okay, so this is a toe-up sock, so the toe is done, the body is done. I have done the gusset, turned the heel, and have the heel flap, and now I'm just doing the leg. Um, this is the pattern for this sock, is really the recipe um, from Sockmatician's Toe-Up Socks by Nathan Taylor. And... Uh, the yarn I'm using is some self-dyed yarn. The base is the Dyer Supplier 8020 Fingering, which is a superwash merino wool nylon blend. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, phone call came through, had to take it. So um, what I was talking about was how this is knitting up. Um, of course, here is the uh, caked skein of yarn. It's this really lovely um, blue stripe, well, I mean striping, but it was, it's not a necessarily a striping yarn. Um, but it just has this lovely look to it with these light blues and dark blues playing off of each other. And um, I'm, the pattern is, is a plain vanilla toe-up sock. I have added a two by two rib across the top. And that, then that's, of course, continuing on here into the leg. I'm getting close to the first one being done. Um, so I, there is that. Now, I just cast on because I fin just finished up one shawl. I am in the midst. I just cast on another shawl. So I'm only this far. Basically have finished 
the first uh, the first chart one time through, and now it's just simply repeat and continue on as big as I want it to go, and then there's some ending charts. This is the Spring Thaw Shawl. I have knit this several times. It is one of my go-to shawls. It's very pretty. It's very lacy. Um, and it just, it looks really, it looks just really good. Um, it's one of those good basic lace type of shawls. And um, I am knitting this one up. It is definitely going to be a holiday gift in December for uh, someone. The yarn that I'm using on this is Cascade Heritage 150 in the colorway called Yoke. So it's a really, um, a really vibrant yellow that border. It's so the yellow is so intense that it borders on a, a light orange. Um, I mean, just barely. I, if you get it in just the right light with the right kind of intensity and the right you know stuff going on, it, it has this kind of an orangish uh, glow to it. Um, this yarn is a 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. Um, lovely, lovely feel to it. This is actually, it's a sport weight yarn because um, it's a little heavier than fingering. Um, and I'm knitting this on um, US 6 or 4 millimeter uh, circulars. So... Um, so that one's coming along well. I find that these types of lace shawls, at least for me, go quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to get this done in a couple of weeks um, because I have several things that I need to get done between now and December. So there's that. Um, so those are my works in progress. And yeah. So my acquisition world. Um, I don't really have anything. No. Oh, well, I mean, I can show you this. Um, although, if you watch my knit, my knit crate unboxing, you would have seen this already. Um, this is my October knit crate subscription. This is the sock crate that I got, and this is the... Audine Wool's Luxury Sock, which is a absolutely lo lovely 75% superwash merino, 15% nylon, 10% cashmere blend. Oh, it's oh, it feels so nice. Um, the color is called Daphne, which is this very um, khaki green kind of color, and um, I. A lovely color, an absolutely sumptuous yarn, but I have to say, not particularly exciting. I mean, I, I'm i sure it is going to make it either a lovely pair of socks, a, a great hat, maybe a cowl. I don't know what it might turn into. It might even be a little shawlette. Um, let's see, how many yards is it? It's 400 yards even. I don't know, but... It's great, but I'm as I talked about in in my unboxing, I'm a little disappointed with sort of the the colorways that they've gone with um, over the past several months. They've been kind of of eh, not that great. But that's it. No other acquisitions this month. It's been really slow. Um, yeah, hopefully that'll pick up sometime soon. But um. Yeah, who knows? I have a lot of yarn. I have a lot of things that ready to that I want to dye. So um, I have lots of yarn to work with. So I'm, I'm not lacking for that. But then again, who cares? More yarn. Um. So what I've been up to, other than other than knitting on my uh, knitting on the 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 uh, ribs and arrow shawl. Um. Let's see. 
Yeah, the weather's been changing a lot, so there's not a lot of, a lot of activities going on outside. Um, it's just a lot of putzing around the house, uh, reorganizing, redoing some things around here. And, um, yeah, there's just not a lot much going on. Um, let's see. Of course, keeping up with my knitting blogs and, you know, as I said last, um, in my last episode, I, I just really appreciate... Um, all of the bloggers out there because they really keep me inspired and keep me going. Um, like this past Sunday, I had an absolute blast um, watching the live stream with um, Needles at the Ready. Um, and because I watched that, I got too um, informed about another podcast by another male knitter that I had been missing. Um, and that is... Um, Michael with Peace for Peace Crafting Podcast. He's from Chicago. Um, really delightful uh, couple of episodes that he has out. Please go check him out. Give him a subscribe and a like. Um, because, uh, you know, it, it it's good to be appreciated for, for the work we do out here. Um, he's a really, really good knitter. Um, so, yeah, do give him a check out. Um, been, of course, re-watching all of the seasons of Shit's Creek. And, of course, it is so funny. It is such good writing, good acting. Um, love the series. Getting close to the end of, um, season five. And getting ready to go in and watch the new season six, which was just made available not too long ago on Netflix. So um, that's going to be exciting to get into that season. And um, some of the other things I have watched, I watched Enola Holmes. Um, Enola Holmes, a great little movie on Netflix with, um, you know, the girl from uh, Stranger Things, the one that came from the, the, the underside or whatever it is, the, uh, the girl with the funny funky powers well she plays enola holmes the little sister of sherlock holmes and absolutely delightful i'm hoping they make more because it was just so well done so i highly recommend going and watching enola holmes um and then uh just as a as a a lark uh one, I think it was on a uh, one Saturday afternoon. I watched *The Little Vampire* on Netflix. This cute little animated movie um, about a preteen vampire having issues with his parents, not letting him go out. He um, runs into and, and meets up with this. Uh, mortal kid they become friends the mortal kid helps save all the vampire people uh it's just so it's really cute um it's just a lot of fun um so that's really all that i've been watching and doing other than knitting and job hunting um so that yeah that's what that what's been going on there so now it is time to continue my journey on the Book of Yarn and share with you what I have learned over this past couple weeks about everything, uh, uh, you know, yarn, everything I should probably already know. And today we are talking about cellulosic fiber. That would be c cellulosic fiber are, is plant-based fiber that is um processed high, you know highly processed um yeah so cellulosic fiber and let me get over to actually kind of move through this so what is it so the processing of cellulosic plant material, so 
plant material, you know, generally is cellulose. So the cellulosic plant material is going to be your bark, your leaves, the stalks, you know, any of that. Um, things like mulberry tree bark is where it kind of all started. Um, processing that into a liquid solution that's then extruded and hardened into a fiber and then spun into thread and yarn that can then be weaved and um, worked with in, in creating a fabric. So a little history about cellulosic fibers. That it was born out of this, this deep desire to recreate silk, um, making silk more easily accessible and less expensive. So being able to make it out of other things without the use of a silkworm. The Chinese worked on this for thousands of years. But in the mid 1800s, they, they, they started, there was some real progress made in creating artificial silk. Um, and in 1924, that um, artificial silk was actually coined and marketed as rayon. So some general characteristics about cellulosic fibers are, um, of course, it's derived from a, a renew, renewable resource. It's plants, trees, leaves. Um, and so all of those things are biodegradable. So, so is a cellulosic fiber. Now, they generally have, well, and just to backtrack a little bit there, um, it is biodegradable. It is somewhat better for the environment than your synthetic fibers. And we'll talk about that in the next episode. Um, however, some of the, some in, for some of the production, the process can be almost as harmful to the environment as um, a synthetic fiber. Simply from the, you know, use of chemicals, um, uh, many of them caustic, um, the use of a lot of water. So the processing of these can be um, highly, uh, you know, have a, a big carbon footprint if that's what's important. Um, but the fabric that you get is really fluid to its feel. It's, it has a real silky quality, um, usually very luminescent, it has a nice sheen to it. Um, it has good dimensional stability in, in what that means is that it, it maintains its shape relatively well. Um, it does, it can shrink um, from being wet. And also, um, the more it is worn and stretched without washing and reblocking, it can lose its shape over time. Um, it dyes really well. It is also highly absorbent of water. But one of the things I read is that when it gets wet, it the fibers tend to weaken until it gets dried out again. So it would be somewhat easy to damage the fibers while they are wet. Um, and then um, in, in sort of a general term, the shape of the extrusion or the spinneret shape can have a, direct, a, a dramatic effect on what type of fiber you have what sheen it has, how strong it is, um, all those types of things. As we've sort of learned from our protein-based and our cellulose-based fibers, the different shapes and scales and twists to those fibers give it its different characteristics. Now, you may have heard the term viscose. And I'd always wondered what that meant. Well, viscose is actually the process of creating cellulosic fiber, like rayon. So rayon and viscose are sometimes an interchangeable terminology. The term viscose actually comes from the fact that you have um, created this this very pulpy liquid you basically basically liquefied a plant into a viscous um, solution that then is extruded into a fiber um, so this is the most common process for breaking down your plant material 
from your raw cellulose and regenerating it, regenerating it into that spinnable fiber. So basic process in very short nutshell. Chopped up, soaked in a caustic soda solution to break it down. Um, the pulp is then squeezed, shredded, and fermented multiple times sometimes. It's then treated with a um, carbon bisulfide or some other and, and it, depending upon what type of uh, fiber is being created, sometimes they use some other uh, chemicals as well, which allows that um, will sometimes be the, the process by which those fibers are hardened again into something that's spinnable. Um, others use sulfuric acid to re-harden the, the liquid into... Uh, something that's a strand of fiber. So the most, now of course the first marketed um, material was rayon, or the first marketed fiber. Very comfortable and soft against the skin, very luminescent and has a great sheen as you can see. Um, it does take dye really well, although sometimes the dye is added to the liquid before the extrusion process. And so the, the, the color of the fiber becomes ingrained in the fiber itself. Um, it's smooth and firm, can make a very dense yarn, but still has this lovely drape to it. Um, not as much elasticity as a protein fiber, and as I mentioned before, it can stretch out of shape over time. Now, a subset of rayon is a fiber called modal. And this is instead of, um, rayon tends to be made from the mulberry tree. Um, modal is made from a beech tree. It has some very similar characteristics, very smooth, soft, um, similar to a mercerized cotton, um, very absorbent, um, but even more so than mercerized cotton, dyes well, is color fast in warm water, so that makes it easy to wash. Um, it also resists pilling, shrinking, and fading. So it's a very, very versatile fabric. Acetate, which is a fiber that we've heard of, but maybe not from the standpoint, or that I, I had heard of, but not from the standpoint of a cloth fiber or a yarn fiber. Um, it was developed in the late 19th century from cotton and tree pulp. It um, is a very breathable fabric, pretty absorbent. Um, Key things about it, hypoallergenic, resistant to mold and mildew. Um, acetate fibers were used in the creation of other types of um, products as well, other than, than yarn. Um, it was used first as a varnish in World War I for airplanes. Um, because it's non and and then later on in the early days of motion pictures it was used to make film for for movies because it was non-flammable and because um you were shining a very high powered light through the film uh, that film needed to be um very very sturdy to the heat coming off of the lamp so that was important for it to be non-flammable and so those were, that was acetate film. Um, so Lyocell, which um, has a trademark name of Tensile. So you may have heard of, uh, of seeing Tensile being used within um, uh, some blends of fiber. I have some that instead of using nylon actually uses Tensile. Um, came to market uh, relatively recently in 1992. It's a wood pulp based, dissolved in a different solution from rayon before being extruded. Um, 
has gr good dimensional strength, so it does keep its shape better than rayon does. Uh, very absorbent, r great for um, warm weather and uh, southern southern climates where you need something that's very breathable. Bamboo, which is um, a fiber that we are starting to see a lot of. Um, relatively new, primarily coming to us from China. Be, you know, makes sense. They grow a lot of bamboo there. Um, this was something interesting. I find this, this was really fascinating. It contains an antibacterial quality. Um, and it, that quality doesn't wash out. It's good. It has, absor uh, it's really absorbent and very breathable. To me, this this sounds like it would make a fabric made from this would make great bandages in a medical medical field because it's antibacterial. It breathes. It absorbs. It sounds like it would make a really good bandage wrap that could be reused. Um, bamboo is often blended with linen, cotton, other cellulosic fibers. Um, so. And, but sometimes you can also find that 100% bamboo fiber uh, and or, or yarn as well. Now, one that I hadn't heard of was soy, and this one, um, this one kind of has an interesting history. In the 1930s, Henry Ford um, wanted to help support the soy industry, and so he pushed for. Um, a rayon type material to be developed from the soybean plant. Um, this resulted in a fiber called Aslan, but it didn't gain any popularity. Um, rayon really won out. Um, it has the, the same luster as silk, the resilience of wool, so it does have good um, bounce back to it. Um, it feels warm, yet still is really good for wicking away moisture. Um, so soy-based um, fibers, you know, have a connection to the auto industry now. Um, corn, which I really hadn't thought about this, but uh, corn is one of probably the newest biotech developments um, in that more and more fibers are being developed from starch or starchy materials. Um, starches are broken down into their sugars, they're fermented, separated into polymers and then extruded into fiber and then spun up into you know your your yarn your thread you know the things that you're going to create textiles from feels a lot like mercerized cotton lightweight and absorbent um, but it's not really good with high heat so uh, you wouldn't be able to iron um, a corn based or a starch based uh, fiber so that's what I learned about cellulosic fibers. You know, so the big question is, is it a um, is it a plant, or is it a synthetic? Because they have uh, I, next week. Well, I think we're going to learn that there's a lot of similarities between synthetic fibers and cellulosic fibers in their in how they are created. Um, it's just that your cellulosic fibers are based on natural fibers, plant material, wood pulp, that type of thing. And that's what creates the um, fiber. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the differences are between cellulosic and synthetic fibers, like acrylic, nylon, polyester. And so um, next time we get together, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, in terms of our lesson. So we have whiled away probably about another, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of our time, and we have come to a close. So, hey, I want to thank you, uh, you guys for checking it out and uh, sharing this time with me. Be sure and go to my web to my channel and look at some of the other things that I'm doing. Um, the dyeing of the yarn, the uh, unboxing of, of items coming in, 
Um, who knows what else I might be doing uh, at some point on this channel. Um, give me a shout out in the comments. Let me know what you're up to. Uh, let me know what you want to see. And we'll, hey, we'll see if, if, that, if I can uh, do some of that. Let me know what some of your favorite patterns are. What are you working on? Um, I love being inspired by what you all do as well. Um, you can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook page for Great Scott Knitting. I'll have the link to that down below in the show notes. I have an Instagram account under Great Scott Knitting and a Ravelry account, which is Great Scott KCMO. So I really do appreciate you guys uh, watching and letting me know how you feel about this, uh, the content you get here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So uh, enjoy your knitting. <laughs>